we're going to talk today about the topic of exercise, the potential benefits, and and I th I'm not going to really make a whole lot of editorial comments, but I think that you will see by the end of this that you'll probably be wondering why aren't we pounding the table um, at trying to make this incorporated into every form of schizophrenia treatment today. Um, you'll see it covers a broader range, a broader range of symptoms and um, hope to get you, I'll review this literature and hope to get you intrigued about it. So I thought I would start off with, I know this guy. I do in fact know this guy. Um, I was talking to him. He knew I was a psychiatrist at some point after talk, chatting with me about many things and me not even suspecting that this is an individual who would ever have any kind of significant so-called mental illness. He discloses to me that he's been treated for schizophrenia for, uh, about 10 years. Um, and notably, in addition to having no obvious outward symptoms or blunting of affect or any other or motor symptoms or what have you, um, he went on to tell me that he had been continuously ill, multiple hospitalizations, multiple new first line antipsychotic medications um, with poor success. Eventually, he insisted with his outpatient doctor that, um, that they initiate a therapeutic trial of haloperidol, uh, and the, the, the patient told his doctor that this insistence was based upon the fact that during one of his hospitalizations, he'd been given haloperidol as an emergent medication, and he thought it did better than about anything else that he'd taken. So he, in addition to taking only two milligrams of haloperidol a day um, and being symptom-free, runs his own business, um, uh, tells me he pays close attention to what he eats, and he gets up and exercises every morning. So I thought that um, all these things, they may wind up going together, but I thought I would just break these down a little bit and, and, um, and talk about it in terms of factor analysis. So I know that not a small number of people who are practicing psychiatry would think that two milligrams of haloperidol a day is a really, really low dose. And maybe some people might even think it couldn't possibly do anything but it actually does, according to this um, dose occupancy study of D2 receptors. Um, every patient in this series was given two milligrams of haloperidol once a day, and after two weeks, every one of them underwent PET scanning to look at D2 occupancy, and you find that that dose produces a really substantial amount of D2 receptor antagonism, and um, it's right within the range of levels of receptor occupancy that we have thought for quite a long time are associated with therapeutic response and with minimizing exopyramidal side effects. So bottom line, two milligrams per day is actually a reasonable dose. And notably, to the point that I couldn't detect any hint of negative symptoms or reduced prosody of speech or blunting of his affect, um, having this dose with this range of occupancy avoids anhedonia, abulia, and so forth, the so-called secondary negative symptoms, which you get by too much antagonism of D2 receptors. And also, to the point he can run his own business successfully, um, some, several studies have shown that higher doses of antipsychotic drugs, both first and second generation, are associated themselves with impairment of cognition, which may be due to in some cases, muscarinic receptor antagonism. And in some cases, I believe, again, me now speculating, that blocking hedonic circuits uh, takes sort of the pleasure out of learning and then makes things more difficult to, makes information difficult to acquire. So I think his low dose of haloperidol is not actually a low dose. I would call it a good dose or a correct dose. It just seems lower than what a lot of folks are used to. Um, he also pays very close attention to eating not junk food, eating vegetables and fish. Um, and so we'll call that whatever you want, whole foods, clean, healthy diet. Um, and diet is probably an underappreciated, diet is an underappreciated factor in mental health outcomes. Um, 
uh, you'll all get a PDF of this talk at the end, and we'll have a full length of references at the end of the PDF. Uh, so you'll get the citations for all these things. But uh, if you're interested, a uh, recent publication by Sarnia has reviewed the small collection of studies that point to a probable and in some cases very substantial therapeutic benefit for at least some people with schizophrenia when they're given a ketogenic diet. Um, there's another review article which talks about a signal for benefit probably again in a subset of people with schizophrenia um, who are given gluten-free or grain-free, dairy-free diets. Um, and the grain-free, dairy-free diet intervention is a very old intervention showing signs of efficacy as early as the late 1960s. Um, and then there's this other old and interesting fact that the prevalence and the incidence of schizophrenia is pretty much the same across countries, but the disability that results from the illness varies significantly according, uh, across countries. And if you look at the ratio of fat comprised of vegetable and fish sources versus other, you'll find that in per capita dietary data account for more than 90% of the variability in disability outcomes. So there probably is something to the package of um, lifestyle that, that is labeled healthy eating. And then the third factor that this man um, disclosed as what he thought was helpful in his very substantial recovery was daily exercise. Um, here is a, this paper is open source, um, Morris et al. And it's, it's well worth reading. Um, it, it shows basically that schizophrenia has multiple areas of symptom occurrence or impairment. You have negative symptoms, positive symptoms, general symptoms, you have cognitive uh, difficulties, and these translate into a variety of everyday impairments. Um, exercise actually, according to human data in other mental illnesses, human data in general, and or human data in people with schizophrenia pretty much addresses all of them. Um, you see a reduction of clinical symptoms, positive, negative, and, and cognitive. Amongst the cognitive symptoms, there's actually a very large effect size associated with aerobic exercise and social cognition, which amongst the cognitive deficits is probably the most damaging or um, disability producing uh, feature of schizophrenia. And if you can address total symptom severity, negative symptom severity, and cognition, you will, of course, um, see general improvements in everyday functioning, social functioning, and, and so forth. Um, so it does many, it general, in, in clinical expressions, it can hit every important aspect of the illness. And um, if you look at specific pathophysiological features, uh, again, this is now a combination of um, abundance of animal, animal data, um, reasonable human data in general, and in some cases, human data within people with schizophrenia. They all converge on the same outcomes generally. Uh, you'll see that you can increase synaptic plasticity, you can um, increase hippocampal size, increase gray matter thickness, um, improve the connectivity between white matter tracts. So again, white matter is the wiring of the brain. So it, it allows information to go from one site to some distant other information processing site. And you need highly, highly functional connections in order to send this information at the right speed to uh, generate efficient processing. And white matter, white matter tract distortions are abundant in schizophrenia. So we have evidence that, that exercise can um, target these factors. Um, it increases the amount of astrocytic support cells. It actually can change um, DNA methylation, so it changes gene expression. And interestingly, um, there is data that suggests that people who exercise modify the methylation of the DNA, and they pass that methylated, that, that um, epigenetically changed DNA to their offspring. Uh, so these epigenetic changes can be passed down through sperm uh, to offspring and, and so forth. And it can increase cerebral blood flow probably by increasing microvasculature growth in the brain. Um, probably the most, the, 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 there are many possible neurochemical explanations for this. The one that seems to have the most evidence that 
could explain a lot of the other downstream effects is an effect on, on a thing called brain-derived neurotrophic factor. So people that exercise can generate more BDNF um, and it can be generated both centrally and peripherally and cross into the brain. From there, BDF can account for synaptic growth and maintenance and um, another, we'll pause at that one. Um, another interesting finding um, is that exercise, when we're engaged in aerobic exercise, we are releasing free fatty acids into our bloodstream because we're metabolizing fat for energy. Those free fatty acids will kick off tryptophan that is taught, that is linked to albumin circulating in the serum. And free tryptophan can then enter across the blood-brain barrier and then can convert it into serotonin. Uh, so that, is, I mean, that is one pathway whereby exercise can directly and relatively quickly improve mood. Um, there's also one of the early studies of um, endocannabinoid research showed that uh, people who are runners or cyclists who experience um, a so-called runner's high, um, oftentimes that, that runner's high feeling is thought to be released due to the release of anandamide or the production of anandamide. So we can, we can target endocannabinoid dysfunctions. So in the interest of time, um, I'll just mention one other thing that a dominant theory about what causes uh, a person to convert from having genetic risk for schizophrenia into symptom expression of schizophrenia or to cross from prodromal symptoms to full symptoms is the production of oxygen free radicals. Um, and the generation of so-called oxygen oxidative stress. Um, exercise, paradoxically, in the short term, creates more oxidative stress because we burn more oxygen to, to do the exercise. But following that short-term deliberate oxidative stress, the body creates a lot more antioxidant defenses. So on net um, of all inputs, you wind up with having uh, people who exercise regularly having increased ability to fight oxidative damage. And I didn't include this slide, but interesting finding from Finland shows that, um, and Finland, like all Nordic countries, is amazing because you can get extremely good data at an entire population. So a Finnish long-term study of a birth cohort from 1986 um, measured um, physical activity at several points in development. Um, they scored physical activity among, among things like involvement in sports activities, um, et, et cetera. So it turned out that lower physical activity scores in childhood and adolescence translated into, uh, into an independent risk factor for um, later life diagnosis of schizophrenia. Um, that is accounting for maternal and parental mental illness and other known risk factors. So. Um, lack of activity, um, you could interpret that two ways. People that are genetically predisposed to develop schizophrenia are less interested in that um, physical activity and so forth, or people who are, for other reasons, um, less physically active um, have factors which make them more likely to express genetic latency for schizophrenia. Um, so again, multiple pathways whereby exercise can work to address specific pathophysiological mechanisms relevant to symptom expression. So um, if that wasn't enough, then uh, putting aside known data on symptom expression and known data on pathophysiological mechanisms, um, here are some re other reasons that a person would want to think about recommending or encouraging exercise. People with schizophrenia have um, two or more fold risk of finding type 2 diabetes in their first degree relatives. So there's a probably built in component of insulin resistance or diabetes proclivity amongst people who are um, experiencing prolonged psychosis. Uh, with this illness comes higher risk for underactive or sedentary lifestyle. Um, so combine proclivity to insulin resistance and proclivity to low activity with I was I, I read one of Kreplin's books from you know what, her original, original textbooks. I was amazed what they could figure out in 1919, um, and Kreplin was citing studies from that era which showed that people with with what he called dementia precox burn less oxygen. They have they we would translate that now into having lower basal metabolic rate. Um, he said that this was a very consistent and very profound finding amongst that. Uh, group of patients. And modern studies have essentially, I mean, actually several studies along the way have, have, re have reconfirmed that finding. Uh, a recent example being this one from Kerchik et al, um, showing that there was um, 
of all people that they studied, 98% uh, of them would be uh, categorized as very low um, resting VO2 consumption compared to age and demographically mass standards. Uh, so if you have all these, plus you're, you're having a lower met metabolic rate, then of course you have higher risk for obesity and, in, and uh, with obesity comes higher inflammation. With higher inflammation comes a multitude of psychiatric illness as well as a multitude of physical illness exacerbations. And that could easily contribute to the significantly reduced lifespan that's been repeatedly documented amongst people with schizophrenia. Um, so um, although the research looks extremely promising across the board, uh, keep in mind that the only people that are studied for exercise are the people that are volunteering for exercise studies. So there's a selection bias at play. Um, and the people that are open to being in exercise research um, certainly could probably have a psychological framework that is different from non-volunteers. And that may translate as well into sort of a physiological difference between these subgroups. So it might not be generalizable to all people with schizophrenia. Um, and the way that non-pharmaceutical sponsored research goes is that you have a handful, you have an investigator or a small team that comes up with their study using their resources. Another group will have another study using their resources. Um, the general theme will be the same, but the details across studies will be sufficiently different to make it um, a little bit difficult to make broad generalizations. And also single investigator or small group studies necessarily involve smaller numbers of people. So they're not ideal uh, studies in terms of number or methodological consistency, but the results or the outcomes generally are with the result that exercise is good uh, for psychiatric symptoms. But also because of differential methodology, we can't say how often, how intense, how long, or whether aerobic exercise is far greater than weight training exercise or that sort of thing, for example. Um, having said that, most all of exercise um, studies in schizophrenia are with aerobic exercise at a min minimum of three days a week for a minimum of 40 minutes per session. Um, so we have a lot to learn and there are some caveats to the data, but still, um, assuming minimal appropriate precautions are taken, you have an intervention which is very low risk, which has reasonable potential to reduce negative symptoms, reduce positive symptoms, improve cognition, improve body composition, improve glucose regulation, um, elevate a depressed basal metabolic rate, uh, maintain healthy blood pressure, lipid profile, um, improve in, where, de, where mood is depressed to lift mood, where mood is anxious to calm mood, and notably address social isolation. A lot of people, as you all probably know, a lot of people with schizophrenia are socially isolated. They feel very different. Um, if we were as a profession to make this recommendation across the board for patients, probably we would want to do this ideally with a personal trainer or in a group so that you'll get a person out of their house into some sort of other social environment um, that can be a big factor at knocking out social isolation and exercising in groups or with trainers is a very quote unquote normal activity a lot of non-mentally ill people do this regularly so it's a link to quote unquote normal life again for people who feel oftentimes very much alienated so a ton of potential benefits um, and I'll leave it at that for you to wonder why we don't do this at scale. And um, there are some references for the studies I cited. And that's the end of, end of comments on that.